Okay, let's try this again. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Hello. Sorry about that. I was going to start class from my iPad, and it was working <laughs> fine this morning, and then uh, I went to log in again and could not get on, so I, I started on my computer, so I apologize for that. It looks like almost everybody is here. There's some people that uh, signed in and then left. So let's see, looks like there's uh, about 21. Uh, let's see, okay. One thing that I want you to try to do for next time, if you're logged in as a guest, I guess that means that you didn't use your net ID to log into Zoom. Is that, is that what happened? Some of you that are in as a guest? Uh, Who has no idea what I'm talking about? I, I have no clue. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Nicole. So let's see. Let's see your name here. All right. So did you, Nicole, did you log in with your net ID? I your logged Montclair? in with my Montclair email with your Montclair email and it still has you as a guest. Interesting. Okay. So I guess you need to log in. We'll talk about that after. Sure. No problem. Um, so I, I imagine that some, uh, many of the uh, rest of you did this, had the same situation, but it's showing up as a guest. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, just trying to work all this out. So I, don't think my iPad's gonna work. I'm gonna just give up on that for now. Um, but my microphone and everything was hooked up to that. So I guess we'll do the best that we can. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, thank you, thank you. So my name is Rob Eiler. I'm your instructor for NUFD 150. This is uh, section uh, six of the course, which means there are six sections in total and this is the first time ever that they are going to be taught 100% online. Typically, this is a lab course. There's lecture than lab. So one thing that changed, because I have no idea what's going to happen in a few months, is you are not going to be doing, you're not expected to do any of the labs yourself at home, because some of you might be in the dorms. Some of you might be staying with a friend or in a hotel or whatever the situation. So you might not have access to everything. So what I'm going to do is record the labs, the activity, and then uh, there will be a few different ways that you can participate in the assignment. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a couple of weeks because the lab activities don't start up for a few weeks, okay? Um, one other thing, it's kind of a little bit interesting to navigate, and I'm not sure how your other classes do it. Right now, obviously, because I'm speaking, um, everyone is, is muted. So that's, that's, that's cool. That, that makes sense, because who knows what other noises there are in the background. The only thing is, as far as attendance goes, if everyone is muted and your camera is off, then how do any of us know that you're actually there? So uh, probably moving forward, you probably wanna have your, your cameras on too, or at least for, for a little bit, and then you could turn it back off, okay? Um, I'm going to do a syllabus review, go over some of the lecture, and then I, I wanna have a little discussion where everyone can get to know each other a, a little bit better. Okay, uh, let's see. I don't have anyone waiting to be admitted it, uh, in the lobby. We're still missing a few people, but all right. I see people are turning their cameras on. Good morning. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is go over the syllabus. It's changed a little bit because we are basically online but it's important that we go over it. So I'm just gonna pull that up.
Okay. Can everyone see my uh, see my screen? You can see see Chrome or Canvas. All right. Just try to expand this view a little bit so I can see everybody. Again, thank you for your patience as I uh, try to do this in a way that I was not set up to do. So this is a last minute thing. Turn this off. Let's see, someone from class is messaging me. Okay, so I'm getting a whole lot of Zoom messages, but I think, uh, I think we're okay. Those of you that messaged are in the class. Okay, anyway, so the syllabus. This is like a cruel joke right now. My computer is uh, failing me. Okay, everyone can still see Canvas, right? All right. And um, I have to say, in all the years that I've been teaching this course, this is the most that everything has gone wrong all at the same time. Well, not everything. I mean, we're all still here, so uh, that's a good thing. But let's start the syllabus finally. All right, so. You could also click a PDF file of the syllabus if you want to download it. Again, this is NUFD, Food Composition and Scientific Preparation. It took me about three years of teaching the class to remember what the name is because it's such a long name. But basically what we are going to learn about is food, like food composition, how the, the components of food come together, how the ingredients work, and how you can manipulate those ingredients and have different results. So some things in the lab demos are going to be baking bread with uh, all-purpose flour compared to uh, um, high gluten. So you can see how the texture changes or using liquid fat like a vegetable oil compared to a solid fat in like shortening in muffins to see how the texture changes or adding gums to change the texture. So those types of, uh, those are some of the examples of the activities that we're going to do. Again, my name is Rob Eiler. I am your instructor. And let's see, office hours are by appointment through Zoom. So last semester was the first time, or halfway through last semester was the first time that we had to switch to the, to the virtual meetings so i'm available basically i try to if you send me a message i'll try to respond within the hour definitely within 24 hours so not that everyone is you're definitely not required to to have separate meetings with me through zoom but the people that did ask for separate meetings to go over a paper or a question on their topic tended to have more success. So the time, and I encourage you to ask any questions, the only silly question or, uh, yeah, I'll, we'll stick with the word silly. The only silly question is one that you don't ask. So it's best to be upfront. It's best to ask questions. If you want to review something, just send me a message or an email and we could talk about it through email or message, a Canvas message. And if we need to, we'll have a, a quick Zoom meeting. Okay. Um, one thing to remember is when we look at the schedule and we see when the papers and assignments are due, if you want to have, so if the paper is due on a Monday morning and you request a Zoom meeting at 11 p.m. on Sunday, there's not a guarantee that you're going to have one. So as I'd say, at least a couple of days before the assignments are due, you, uh, I'll be available. Maybe right before, but it's, it's not a guarantee, okay? Um, the schedule, so even though it's listed as part of the syllabus, it's subject to change. 
So you want to look at the due dates on your individual Canvas assignments. Is everyone familiar with Canvas? I, we're all muted, so I guess nod your head yes or shake your head no. Okay, very good, thank you. So if you're not, or if you have questions about Canvas, of course, just let me know after class, send me an email and we could go over it. But if you got to this point to join the Zoom meeting, you at least got your notifications which were sent out through Canvas, so I think everyone is, is good to go. What I am going to say as far as the live class meetings, right now there are five scheduled, including this one. I'm not going to add any more. So if you have work or an appointment on a day that we don't have a, a scheduled class, I'm not going to change it, okay? There's a chance that we may not actually meet for all of the scheduled live classes that are, that are listed on a schedule. We'll see how, how the format goes and how everyone's doing with the information and the, rec and the recorded lectures. So just to recap, I'm not going to add any surprise live days that are not already on the schedule in the syllabus. Everyone understand? Let's see the nods. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is now a interdisciplinary studies elective, which some of you may be taking the course for that. And all that that means is as we go through, we're going to talk about the, the economics of some ingredients used, the economic, you know, economics, psychology, also I mean, basically the, what we can relate the concepts in this food science class to, uh, it's basically limitless. You know, there are so many different things. Here are some that are listed, chemistry, biology, physics, physiology, Again, I said economics, psychology, and one that's not listed here is nutrition, which might sound funny that we're linking it to nutrition, but you want to remember that this is an introductory food science class. We're going to talk about nutrition a lot, but it, we're looking at foods not from a nutrition lens, it's through a food science lens. But that having that nutrition so close, it's actually a di different discipline, but we can kind of put them together frequently throughout the course. Again, Canvas is required. It's required to access course documents and related materials. So each week there's going to be your assignments. Well, there's gonna be the module, which has all of all of the lecture material for today. And then your assignments tab, which you don't really have any, I didn't activate them yet, but your assignments will be here and they, they will all have due dates. So you can just go to assignments and you'll know when everything is due. I'll go back to the syllabus here. We have a quiz at the end of the semester. Uh, and an exam sounds scary, so I'm just calling it a quiz. Um, it's basically, well, I'll tell you more about it. Uh, the access, it's given through Canvas and you'll be given an access code through Canvas. I'm not gonna require you to use Lockdown Browser or anything like that. It's just a quick quiz that you're going to do at the end of the semester. There are, no makeups offered. There's not really makeups offered for anything. Uh, Canvas is required to submit all assignments. So if there's an assignment, and basically if you send, if you email me your paper, if I see that you emailed it to me, I'll respond and say upload it to Canvas. So if it's not submitted through Canvas in the upload link, then you did not submit it. Okay. It's just the way that the tracking works. Um, so all assignments are submitted via the corresponding upload links in the assignment tab. So for each assignment, you'll have the tab. You just click upload and upload your file. Basically, you could use uh, DocX, PDF, PowerPoint, or JPEG for images. 
there's an issue when on the computer, especially on the iPad, it might not be so bad, uh, but Canvas has an issue with iPhones. If you're set to the high efficiency mode, the HEIC files, if you ever looked at your camera settings for the iPhone users, if it's set to high efficiency and you upload a picture of something, I'm not going to be able to open it. So just remember, but you don't, you're not really submitting too many photos this semester because that was more for the labs. Just a, just a quick note there. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. So the due date for all the assignments is posted in the assignment description and you'll also see it there's a few places in Canvas where it tells you where your assignment, when your assignments are due. The upload link will be available for 24 hours following the date for partial credit. So basically, if we had something that was, it's, it's more than 24 hours. If we had something that was due next Monday, next Monday at 8.30, you have until Tuesday to submit it, okay? So if you have, if your printer, if you had a printer issue, if whatever the issue is, you don't even really have to email me, just send it in the next day. If it was like, I went to submit it and then my, um, you know, my computer crashed and you would have submitted it on time, then you can send me an email. But if everyone's computer is crashing at once and you submit it at 11 o'clock the next night, then there's pro there's an issue there. So, but basically, you can submit it late if you need to, but you should do your best. It's expected to be handed in on time, but sometimes life's emergencies get in the way. Everyone understand that? Yes, okay, thank you. All right, so attendance. Now, historically, when this was a lab class, meaning in person, it had, uh, there's a very strict attendance policy. If you missed, labs you basically were not allowed to miss which good thing we're not meeting live this semester so i don't really have to get into that but for our live class meetings like this one today the live meetings via zoom the attendance is mandatory if you are not present you miss the court you miss the class and will be marked absent i'm not marking anyone late today <clears throat> excuse me so today we don't really have to worry about being late, but if we have a live class that starts at 8.30, if the technology allows and we actually start on time and you sign in at nine and say, hey, what did I miss? You, you lost part of that class. And if you do that a few times, if it's habitual, then you'll be marked absent. And if you miss two or more, of the live meetings like this like the zoom live meetings that are on the schedule your final grade will be reduced by a, a it could be a full letter grade that you lose which sounds a little harsh but uh in the in recent semesters i've learned a few things uh, or i've been thrown a few surprises apparently um Oh, so if your family goes on vacation, that's not considered an emergency. That, uh, that's something that's happened to me twice in the, last, in the last year and a half. Someone went on vacation. So if you're going on a vacation, do not ask me for an alternate assignment. That is a choice you're making. Um, that's basically it. For the quiz, now, a makeup may be requested in the event of extreme emergency situation. So essentially, I decide, or the department decides, or the dean of students decides what this, what constitutes an extreme emergency situation. If it, again, a vacation is not, does not qualify for that. Of course, if you, if you go to the hospital or whatever it is, then 
that obviously is appropriate for a makeup, but it's not just remember, it's not what you would necessarily, what you would think of as an extreme emergency. It's what the university overall would assume, would identify as an extreme emergency. So the request along with supporting documents needs to be submitted. So if, if it has to go up to the chair of the nutrition and food studies department, or to the Dean of Students, whatever it is, if necessary, it, it will be. Um, so the vacation actually did go to the Dean of Students and it did not get approved, of course. Uh, supporting documents would be a physician's note, a police accident report, uh, if there's a, a you know, a death certificate, those things you would supply to the department, not, not to me. Hopefully none of this uh, is needed for this semester. Typically, if you know that there's going to be a situation, you would notify me two days before and Linda Salazar, she's our department administrator. And if there, if something happens that day, you should try to let me know by 4 p.m. the following day, okay? Course assignments, the quiz may include material from the PowerPoint presentations, the lecture and laboratory activities. Guidance and rubrics for all assignments will be provided. The disciplines addressed during the lectures will be identified in each of the lesson materials and verbally by the instructor. So basically what that means is when we talk about the different disciplines, I'm going to explain them to you. You know, tying in the chemistry, the nutrition, physics, whatever it may be for that lesson. For every written assignment or every assignment, there will be a rubric that is included in the assignment tab. So you'll be able to look at that and, and figure out how you're going to be graded because you upload your, your submission to Canvas. I open the speed grader. I grade right off the rubric, so I just, you know, you met the criteria, you had how, the right amount of words, whatever it is, I just push the buttons, there's your grade, so I try to get grading done very quickly. Student assessment, here are some of the assignments. So for this semester, what I want you to do is take a food product. It could be your favorite food that you eat. It could be a food product that you wanna learn more about, whatever, whatever it is. The assignment will probably be easier for you if you pick something that has a label. So if you said your favorite food is apples and you wanna know more about what's in them, it, that's doable, but the assignment might look a little uh, different. So we can discuss that. But the first part of that, and I'm going to give more detail in a further uh, recording, but the first part of that is basically you identify the food and then you talk about, you tell me what you know about it without looking at anything. What information do you know about it? Do you like it? Do you dislike it? What are the ingredients? Whatever, whatever you know at this time, whatever your opinion is, your feelings about the food. For part two, you're going to, and again, I'll give you information on how to do this and I'll show you, you're going to look up each of the ingredients that are on the label and explain why those ingredients are in that food. And the reason for this is because some products are of a higher quality than others. And sometimes the quality is determined by the ingredients that are included. So, but that doesn't always, higher quality doesn't always mean that it's the most expensive. Sometimes there's an expensive product that is just marketing and hype. And when you look at the ingredients, there are things in there that you wouldn't really want to consume or that are there just to save money. Part three is just a submission of sources, research, you know, peer reviewed articles. Part four is basically putting all of what you found in the first three parts together. 
and that's a 1500 word paper. And I didn't mention this earlier, but the, the writing requirement comes from the fact that this is now an elective class. So once it became an elective, we had to have a 2000 written word writing evaluation. Next, we have the responses to the five labs. And then, so we used to do uh, the end of the semester, your, your practical final was basically everyone would show up to class for the last lab and there would be one special ingredient that everyone had to use and then you had a limited pantry, if you will, of other ingredients, but you were not given eggs, you were not given milk. It was basically dairy-free, gluten-free, um, ingredients and you had to try to figure out how to make a brownie incorporating the secret ingredient. Being that we can't do that this year, the idea is to create a new brownie recipe and you're going to use your knowledge that you learned throughout the semester of different ingredients and how they behave. So say if you're using a gluten-free flour, you'd want to add xanthan gum to help with the texture. The next assignment is a brownie box label poster. So you're going to take the that brownie recipe that you made, all those ingredients, and you're going to actually make uh, a box as if you're going to buy this brownie mix in the store. So you're going to learn uh, proper labeling and allergen declarations and what the nutrition facts panel should look like. Then there's the, the quiz, which is uh, worth 50 points. So there's 500 points total for the class and you are graded on a percentage. So if you have 100 to 93%, then that's an A and so on. It's, let's say you have and 86 and at the end of the semester when you look on canvas you realize that your at your percentage is 86 i appreciate all the emails saying how much you learned in the class and how much you love it and you told your aunt and uncle about something you learned and those emails are great but if when the last sentence says so i really think i should have you know, a B plus instead of a B, the time to make sure, the time to do whatever you need to and have that discussion on how to get your grade higher is early in the semester. Don't wait till the end. Because if you have an 86, that's a B, not a B plus. Okay? What I hope you're getting from this is that you should reach out and ask questions early on and as often as you need to and not wait till the end, okay? It's probably too soon to tell this story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway, even, uh, you know, just because here, here we all are and uh, we've known each other for 15, 20 minutes or so now. Once upon a time when I was a freshman, I was in an intro to philosophy class and all they talked about the professor every day was talking about rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric. I had no idea what the word rhetoric meant. Do you think I raised my hand and say, I'm a little confused. No, I didn't. I was silent all semester. So you know what happened? I had to take intro to philosophy again. Okay. But he, so I made the mistake. And that's why I think it's important. And it's important enough to me for you to know that you should and could ask me questions that I share that story. Okay. Um, since we're talking about this, I could tell you a little bit more uh, about myself and, and how I got here. I have been on Montclair's campus for more years of my life than I have not been on Montclair's campus. My first bachelor's degree was 
was from Montclair uh, in psychology with a minor in counseling. Then I was in grad school for a master's in teaching with a certification in phys ed and health and realized that I wanted to shift gears. So I had to withdraw from grad school to get to apply for a second bachelor's degree to become a registered dietitian. I was in that program in my second to last semester. I found out that you can't get student loans for your dietetic internship. So for those of you that want to be RDs and did not know that, that could be a little bit of a shock. So at that point in time, I was, I, it all happened basically within three days. I found out that then later that day, I had uh, a guest speaker in one of my classes talk about uh, a certification that she got. And it was called a registered environmental health specialist to become a health inspector. And it sounded like the coolest thing in the world. And it was basically for those of you, has anyone taken serve safe yet? Probably not. Right. Maybe one or two, like the food safety class. I took it already. Uh, who, who did? Who did? I am. Okay, cool. So, I was ta thank you. I was taking that class and it was a one credit class at Montclair. It was 240 and I didn't really need it anymore. And I tried to drop it, but I couldn't because it was too late. So I worked full time all through school anyway. So I'm rambling now, but there, there's a point. I promise I'll get to it. Um, I couldn't get out of the class, but I realized that it was fun and I learned a lot of different things. And when this uh, woman came to tell us about being an inspector, it sounded a lot like what surf safe was just applying it to every day. So after that, uh, so I, I came home that day, I applied for the registered environmental health specialist program at Rutgers. It's called uh, EPH. It's a summer long program. And then you do an internship and you take a state licensing exam. And then I, so I took the exam, finished my last semester at Montclair. Then I started working for the New Jersey department of health in the what is called now the public health and food protection program so i do food inspections i do some restaurants that are on state property so like metlife i was there during the super bowl which was pretty cool it was pretty interesting i do uh wholesale like factories production so one of the coolest places i i ever was was in uh the mars plant in hackettstown which makes m ms so if it's basically like it's literally a chocolate factory. So it was pretty cool. Um, I'm starting now to do dairy inspections. So I'm going from the farms to where the cows are, watching them get milked and watching, you know, the haulers come and fill up the tank trucks, bring it to the plant, and then the milk is pasteurized. So it's a whole new process. Also, I'm involved with the shellfish program, so clams, oysters, those are the predominant ones in New Jersey. Uh, body art, so tattoos, permanent cosmetics, everyone in the world is getting uh, microbladed eyebrows now, so it's very popular. Uh, that's something I never thought that I would be involved in at all, but that's one of the things that, that I, I, I work on. Um, youth camps in the summertime, so a little bit of everything. So that's why it, when you, at the top of the syllabus, I don't have RD after my name because I'm not a registered dietitian. I'm a registered environmental health specialist, okay? Um, but I got there because of the classes that I took at Montclair. Many of the classes that you have taken already or you're about to take. So the possibilities of where you can go after your bachelor's degree in nutrition and food studies, you have a lot of options that you may not have even realized, okay? Oh, and then I came back to Montclair and I got my master's and that's why I'm allowed to teach. So I finished in May and then that following September, I came back and I started teaching the course. So I've been here, I've had a lot of first days of school at Montclair State University. Let's get back to the schedule. So today is live via Zoom. Now, the textbook is not required. If you don't buy it, I don't care. 
the other sections might be required. They might uh, have the assigned reading. If you don't do any of these readings, it doesn't matter. If you do them, cool. Question, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I see that it says brown, but what, if, if you want to get the book, what specific book is it? Oh, I thought it was listed in the bookstore. It's, uh, I, I didn't see it. But. Okay, I'll send a link out. I, I used to be in the syllabus, but I took it out altogether so that people didn't think that they needed it, but I'll okay. send everything to you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, that. sorry about that. Um, so it loosely relates to the content for the week. Some of the PowerPoint slides that I use are from the textbook, but the quiz is going to be basically from the slides or the recordings. Basically, it's things that I've said and are written and presented to you in the recordings. That's what the quiz is going to be and the lab activities, okay? So you'll have a pretty good idea of what the material is that you need to review throughout, as we go throughout the semester. All right. Um, the due dates are already here. You know, part one of that, what is, what's in your food and why is due September 21st, and then so on. So the important dates to remember, well, they're all important, I guess. Um, November 2nd, we start with the lab activities. So this is uh, solid and liquid fat, so shortening of vegetable oil. And then I'm gonna use three different types of flour to show the difference in texture, consistency, mouthfeel, which is gonna be hard to interpret during, uh, through a video, but I'll try my best. Then I'm gonna make some brownies, some cheese, bake bread and make butter. And then you'll have, you'll have um, the activity that you need to respond to. I think it's going to be some type of video response. That's the plan for right now. So you'll notice that there's five activities, but only four weeks. Uh, the bread baking and the making butter are considered to be two separate activities. So on November 23rd, you're gonna have two different activities. But the big dates, the ones that you need to put on your calendar to make sure that you are available, especially during these times, November 30th is the quiz, which means that at 8.30 in the morning, you log in, you take your quiz, and when you're done, you're done for the day, you're for, for the week, right? Because you are going to continue and hopefully by then finish your create a new brownie recipe assignment, which is due on December 7th. And then on December 14th, you have the brownie box label poster. Does anybody have any questions about the schedule or the syllabus? Yeah. Okay. Um, are these gonna be posted on like the assignment section? Like, um, like say the first one, like September 14th, or are they just gonna be on the syllabus? No, no, no. They will be posted on the assignment section. All right. Yeah. So I'm, um, that's why I said always look to the, this gives you the idea. Like these are not going to change, but always look to the assignments. I didn't post them yet because I wanted to uh, review the rubrics one more time before I, before I just threw them up there. But everything will be in the assignments. And again, I'm going to have a separate video for explaining the assignments that we go when we go over them in addition to the lesson and that will all be posted in the i'll probably put it in modules each week when it's a pre-recorded lecture but i'll definitely have an announcement for it so you could click the link any other questions yeah, I have a question. So since we're not going to do the lab anymore, yes. um, are we doing a live meeting at the scheduled time of 9.20 to 11.50 or? Um, some live meetings might take that long, but typically not. The pre-recorded ones might take you longer, but you could watch them whenever you want. Oh, but we're not going to like carry over from this meeting all the way up until 11.50. You mean 
Are we going to finish at 11.50 today? Well, not specifically today, but just in the future. I don't want to say never, but sometimes okay. we might go the full time, depending mm -hmm. on the content. But that's a long time to be sitting in front of your computer. So mm -hmm. uh, in class, typically, the longest time was typically like 20 minutes before, so like 11.30. Okay. But again, there's only four other live meetings scheduled, and we might not even actually meet for all four of those. I'll let okay. you know. Plan on having plan on them being there, but it might it might change. So to clarify, we are not actually going to meet every Monday for the rest of the semester. In total, we're scheduled only for about four. We're scheduled then, for four more. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'll share the. Okay. I'll, I'll share it again. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So that's that's the one thing that I kind of skipped over. So. Sorry. About yeah, because that. that's new to me. I thought we were scheduled every single Monday. Uh, no. It, okay. The requirement is. Can you see? Can you see Chrome? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so the next live meeting is September twenty first, and then after that, it's October fifth, October twelfth, and then November sixteenth. Okay, got it. Thank you. That's it. So the, um, hang on, sorry about that. All right, sorry. So just responding to someone. All right, so yes, there's only go, there's only five total live meetings. The rest is going to be pre-recorded lectures. There will still be interaction with the lab activities. You're essentially, I'm going to do the demo, and then I have to figure out which format exactly is going to work best, but you're going to record yourself responding to it. You know, I found this article, I watched this video, if uh, the lab is making brownies and you want to try it yourself, you can, but that is definitely not required. The issue was the department was going to send out kits like measuring cups and measuring spoons and a few things, but you would have been, you were expected to provide some of your own ingredients which to me is not fair. If we can't give you everything, then I will not ask you to do it. Okay? So that's, that's how this came about. But if your response to one of the videos, if you're so moved to try to just make it yourself, by all means, go ahead. It's not expected. And um, it's really just an option that if you really want to do it. But I, I, it's not like it's going to necessary it's not going to give you like extra credit or extra points if you do it so if you don't do that or if you don't have the facilities to do that please don't feel like you're going to be graded negatively does everyone understand that all right so as long as you can contribute that you'll be graded uh, accordingly all right, so let's see. Does anyone have any other questions about the syllabus? So everything just gonna be provided for the homework since we don't need a textbook, that's it. Like everything, you're gonna give us everything. Everything you need, okay. everything you need. So you don't need the textbook. Um, some of you sound disappointed about that, which is okay, uh, but yeah, I, I will I will upload the information about the textbook so that you can check it out if you want, but but you don't you don't need it. Um, so yeah, you'll have the material each week. Now, part of that and everything all together is basically part of the idea is to get you 
to realize if you don't already that you are responsible for your education. So the question, a better question than what is this guy going to teach me is what am I going to learn? Because that also gives you ownership in it. It's something that you are learning. So if you are passionate about this, for some of you, this course is just three credits you need to get through. For others, you're going to find something that might be in the class or related to something or just in a discussion you had with someone else and your whole career is gonna go in a different direction. Who knows? Um, and I totally just lost my train of thought. But uh, basically, the things that you are, like the ingredient project is just to take something that you consume every day or that you wanna know more about, something you like or dislike and find out as much as you can about it, to study as much as you can. Because as you progress and as you get out of college and you're in the workforce, every assignment you have is basically like the hardest final and longest paper you've ever done. There are no, there are no Bs and Cs. It's an A, as in you get to keep your job or you have to look for another job. So find as you do all of your studies and all of your other and all of your classes, what are you reading articles about? What are you talking to your friends about? What social media pages are you following more to, you know, do you care what other people are looking at? Do you want to, so that you can read more and learn more information about certain diets or nutrition trends or whatever it is, the things that you read and want to learn more about in your free time, hopefully that's the career path you're going in, okay? Um, let's see, let's see. Now, I planned on the class going one way, but I'm gonna change it a little bit right now. I'm going to, I wanna have a little discussion, okay? And then we'll go into uh, a little bit of the lecture after. Everybody ready? Okay. So, have, have you ever heard of the carnivore diet? I see some heads. So those of you that nodded, yes. Would you like to tell me something that you know about the carnivore diet? Anybody? It's um, mostly meat and it's low in carb. Mm. All right, so who is that, Sarah? Yeah. Okay, so mostly meat, low in carbohydrates. Who else? Um, I nodded no, but I'm just guessing it's like purely meat. Like, I'm guessing. Okay, you're guessing that's yeah. Islam? Yeah. All right, thank you. It probably yeah, sure. raises yeah. your cholesterol yeah. levels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicole says it probably raises your cholesterol levels. Okay. So, so I follow this guy on Instagram. He's like famous. <laughs> His name's Sean Baker. Um, he has been doing the carnivore diet for like years and he's been like the healthiest he's been like his whole entire life on this diet. So some people get like, I guess like misconstrued. I don't know. I think it's like, it depends on like your body and what your body needs. Like everyone's bodies are different and your system's different. But um, like even my friend, he went to go on it and he was confused because he didn't, he, like, like uh, Nicole just said, like it raises your, cholest your, your, your cholesterol, but his didn't raise, like it's different, I guess with everybody, but this guy has been on it for the longest time. He's pretty ripped too, cause he like really works out. Like, let me show you guys, I'll show you guys. <laughs> okay. like he probably Gianna does it in moderation. Gianna, yeah. Gianna. He, um, I like follow, I follow like his, um, like his schedule and everything, like what he does, what he eats, everything. Like he eats meat for breakfast. Like, I don't know how he does that. Like I would never be able to do that, but I don't know if you guys can see, but he's in really good shape and, uh, his body, like his health is a hundred percent. Like it's crazy, but I could see how people could think that eating meat all the time is bad for you. Cause red meat, they say is like not good for you to eat it all the time. 
but he does, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> thank you for sharing that, uh, Gianna. So basically, uh, it's Dr. Baker, right? Looks shredded, but his blood levels, they don't really share too much of the, he, does he actually share blood results? I don't think he does. But if he does, are they as important as we think? But a sample size of one does not equal the greatest thing in the world, but it looks like he's done this for years and he's not dead. So for those of you that have never heard of this before, do you have more questions? Any thoughts or anyone? So no vegetables, nothing. What's that? So no vegetables, that, that's it, just meat and, and like water. It's predominantly saying, I'm going to eat only meat. Um, question, is this like, I mean, besides uh, the ripped person that she had just shown, like, do they eat like meat in moderation or just like, do you not nope. weigh it? They just like, they just cook it and then straight eat it. Uh, well, they do cook it, but it's just, I think like sometimes four to five pounds of steak a day. Wow. So that definitely, all right, so. I have a question. Of course, and it's Emily? Yes, hello. All right. So is this the, another name for the keto diet or is this different? It is different than the keto diet. Okay. Yes, yes. So. The ketogenic diet is basically a fat, predominantly fat diet, traditionally, like right. it's a lot of five percent. Well, a ketogenic, a traditional ketogenic diet does not have a lot of protein. It's predominantly fat with like 15% oh, okay. of protein. Um, but through the years, there has been what, so when, I mean, there are people that you'll meet that say they're on a keto diet, but they're eating, um, you know, lentils and beans. It's like, well, right. you're well, not, you're not, you can't be, I mean, if you were like a professional athlete, you could probably still be in ketosis, but no. So anyway, the ketogenic diet is eating to be in ketosis. The right. carnivore diet is just straight up, I'm going to eat meat only. So it's proteins and fats. So it, it, you might, you're probably going to be in ketosis for some of the time, mm -hmm. but it's not, a, it's not a ketogenic diet at all. No. Okay. I have a question. Of course, Joe. Um, um, do people use this diet to like lose weight or like what, what is this like benefiting for like, what's, what's the benefit of going on a carnivore diet rather than like the other diets that are out there? Um, well, does someone else want to answer that? Because I'm not saying that it's good or bad. I just think we should talk about it. I'm thinking it's for someone that's trying to go on a bulk, on a caloric surplus, trying to achieve, like, mm -hmm. muscle mass. That's what I was thinking. Isn't the, isn't the ketogenic diet well created for people who have seizures to um not like to help with the conduction of electrical impulses in their body uh since your nerve endings need to have like fat that's why it's so high in fat and then now people are just kind of you know twisting it to themselves but it's really gonna do some serious damage to your liver because you shouldn't really be doing it long term well and your name is annie yeah, it's Annie. It's spelled like the word, but it's pronounced like Annie. Annie? Then, okay. Yeah. All right, Annie. So um, you touched on a few things. The exact chemistry of, the, of how it works with the, with the nervous system, that could be something that we'll talk about in more detail uh, for later on in the semester, if that's something that if, if everyone's interested in. But yes, the research uh, for the ketogenic diet started... Um, from what I understand, as far as uh, a therapeutic diet for seizures, for seizure disorders, because there's something about the using ketones as, uh, as your energy source that makes your uh, 
that, that helps, especially in children. So, and this is an interesting question, something to think about. So if there is a child that has uh, an epilepsy disorder and they are given this therapeutic diet where they consume ketones and they're following this ketogenic diet and this child, you know, even though that when they're blowing out their candles for their birthday cake, if they celebrate their birthday, you know, the cake doesn't, it still keeps them in ketosis. If that person makes it to 30 years old with no other health issues, is it unhealthy for them? If they make it to 40 years old or 50 years old and they still have no other health issues, is it, is it an unhealthy diet? No. No, but the perception, and there is some science to it, absolutely. There are some people that go on a ketogenic diet and their liver numbers go through the roof and there's all kinds of things that can happen poorly uh, health-wise. So it has a, a negative connotation. But again, so that's the ketogenic diet. Let's bring it back to this carnivore diet. So I'm on the website Carnivore MD. Okay. Um, it's mostly just testimonials about the diet, but it says that benefits are improvements in mood, energy, libido. Um, it could help with fibromyalgia, autoimmune illnesses, and arthritis. That is right. the claim. Okay. So MD, I think for this. It, it, it's probably just, you know, letters because it sounds like you're the authority. All right. Right, MD. right. But anyway, so typically that's what people <laughs> say. If they have, and thank you for, for sharing that, uh, people that have certain issues, um, autoimmune might be willing to try this out because they've tried everything else. But I'm getting, some of you have not said much or anything yet, but I have a feeling that there's some of you that, are being very polite and just not saying how foolish you think this diet could be. I mean, I think it's stupid. Okay. Cause it's like, you're not getting like, yeah, meat has like iron and, and you know, some stuff that you do need, but it's like, you just eating straight meat. You're not getting all the stuff from like that you can get from vegetables and from beans and from like, yeah, like, um, like I said, with the keto diet, like a lot of people don't eat carbs and stuff with that. And you're not supposed to eat like bread and stuff. But like, I feel like just eating meat is not doing anything for your nutritional value. So it's like, right. kind of hurting fiber? yourself. <laughs> and like, it's like, because uh, I feel like it's probably more, yeah, like the, um, I don't know who said, I think it's Islam said, like, it's probably more like bodybuilders and stuff that's trying to like bulk up and stuff. But it's like, they're not getting still like the vitamins and minerals that they need. Okay. And it's cyan? Cyan, yeah. Cyan. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, the vitamin and minerals. How can anyone address that on whatever diet they're on? What do you mean address it? Supplements? If you're, if, if, you're go, if you're on a diet that is going to make you short on minerals or vitamins, you could just take a multivitamin, right? Yeah even though um go ahead like i don't i don't think like it would be the same when taking like a, like i feel like also with like your multivitamin multivitamins like there's also stuff that you could get out of actual food that will benefit you way more instead of like going like i agree with you like i guess we were being polite but like when you actually put it in like like a sentence that oh like it is foolish it kind of like, I kind of think about it and it really is because like, regardless of if you are in a caloric surplus, like it really won't help you that much. You would have to eat a lot and a lot and a lot of meat. Like, yeah. So now, now I understand from that point of view. Okay. And again, I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to push my views. I don't, I hope you can't tell what my view is about this. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but all of you are sharing very important things. And 
there and hearing the discussions, you can tell what you're interested in, what you're not interested in. And scientifically, there's a nutrition sense that we are all, you know, however old you are, that's how many years of being a professional uh, eater you are. Because if you didn't eat, you wouldn't be alive. So we all consume food. It's what we do with it and the foods that we eat that make that uh, make the difference, right? Or can make a difference. So where am I going with this? One thing, and I'm not, and not to 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 pick on anyone or point anything out, but uh, typically, from a biochemistry standpoint, if you're trying to add bulk, you would consume typically in excess in carbohydrates because that's what your muscles are going to utilize to add extra mass. So it's not necessarily the meat alone, but if you do, do you know what your body does if you have an excess of protein and a uh, lack of other nutrients? Um, it just gets rid of it. Like by like the body just does a very good job of like releasing it through uh, like, like you're like, it just releases it. You know, no, as I mean, a waste product? Pro yeah, Protein as a waste will product. get stored as fat, correct? Um, well, it could also be, it could also go through what's called gluconeogenesis. So if we sound that out, gluco, what does that sound like? Glucose. Glucose, glucose right? Right. So the protein can actually be broken down and turned into glucose, which can then be stored as glycogen in your muscles and your liver or... Um, but if there's an excessive amount, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I would have to honestly check this out to see how much it would have to, to go through the phases from protein to glucose, to glycogen, to have an excess of glycogen to be stored as adipose tissue. Okay. So, but let's get back. All right. So who else? Let's hear, let's hear something else about the, the carnivore diet. I guess it keeps you like more, I guess, full than other diets. Okay. Do. That's uh, okay. okay. If you're, if, all right. Um, I'll try to ask this. Um, knowing what you know now, if one of your friends or family members told you they were going to start this diet, what would you say to them? Tell them not to do it. You would tell them not to do it. Mm. Okay. Look into other diets. Other diets. Yeah, because meat is like also expensive on the other hand. Like you're not gonna buy a pound of like mm. a scare steak, but for like or like a scare steak that comes with two pieces for like fifteen dollars. Like it's also okay. about like expense as well. Like I'm not gonna put you on a diet that like you're gonna have to put some money into it while I could just put you on, you know, like a simple diet. Like you know, just eat in a caloric deficit and just like okay. moderation. And if you're creating something. Okay. Anyone else? I'd also, I'd also tell them to like put more research into it and see if that's like a diet that they would uh, actually consider doing. Okay. Be more educated on it. Yeah. I okay. would assess their um, medical history. If there was any contraindications, uh, for example, my, both of my parents really wanted to go on the keto diet. Mm -hmm. However, I'm like, hey, like you guys have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, is this really going to be the best diet to benefit you? Okay. Um, so that's another important factor for sure. Okay. Anyone else? Let's see if there is there one more or two more, maybe? I think that there's I like no. That it just meat. doesn't sound very like exciting. Just eating meat every day. And it's Abigail? Like, something you would want. <laughs> All right, just eating meat every day doesn't sound exciting. Okay. And uh, Sarah? Yeah, I was just going to say that there's like no perfect food and like you need like nothing, not one food is going to provide you with all the nutrients and minerals, everything that you need for your body to run like optimally. So I think that even though like some people might be looking like they're like thriving off of it, it's still like that's like all social media and stuff. You don't know how they're feeling on a daily basis and how much energy they have. It's just, you know, it's just like all perception and stuff. So 
I think that there's no perfect food in like every a little bit of everything is just going to make you feel like way better than that. Okay, you're so be a little bit of craving everything. a lot more foods. Like obviously your body runs off carbs like better than other like fat protein. So okay. I think that you'd be craving that. Okay, interesting. So uh, anyone else? Oh, I agree with um Abigail on like pure enjoyment. Like you just wouldn't be able to sustain it because like me every single day would be like too excessive and like you can only go for such a long time with it. So yeah. Okay, and it's uh Luan? Loon. Lou? Thank yeah. you, Lou. So there are some things, you know, how you lose the variety, things like that. Okay. Uh, what's interesting to me, and I don't know if you realize this, those, th thank you to those that responded, all, but predominantly, based on the responses, the assumption was that you're prescribing a weight loss diet to somebody. So to you, a diet is restricted calories or restricted foods or something like that, right? It's usually a diet is something that you do to make you smaller or lighter. Is that the perception? I mean, you have people that like do meal prep, like my sister, like this is not necessarily a diet. It's not necessarily for you to lose weight. There are other diets that people have just to like maintain the way that they are. So it's like you have people that eat like six times a day, but they're eating a specific amount of food throughout the day. It's not like, oh yeah, I'm eating a whole big steak or I'm eating a whole bunch of this. They have like a specific amount. So it's like, that's not a type of diet that people use to like lose weight, like in my opinion. Okay. Um, but if you look in its most basic definition, a diet is simply the food that you consume. So even, or when you talk about anything so what is your if there's someone their diet is donuts and then chicken wings that's their diet like if you saw that person at the zoo it would say their name and then they feed on you know however many donuts and however many chicken wings per day not that people should be in zoos but you understand like when we were kids and learned about like tigers and bears it's like well bears eat this tigers eat this so a diet is simply what people consume but you can make manipulations to the diet to do different things, whether it's lose mass, add mass, you know, um, if you want to have explosive, quick power, if you want to be able to run, you know, ultra marathons, things like that. So a lot of what we know or think we know or have been conditioned to tell people doesn't really apply to everybody. But I want to get to this. So overall, some of you say like the carnivore diet could be good for some, but if you knew someone that wanted to try it, you would, knowing what you know now, you would tell them not to do it. And then Phyllis um, asked, how do you get proper nutrition without fruit or vegetables. So I would imagine, Phyllis, that you're talking about vitamins and minerals. If you wanna, if you wanna. Uh... Yeah, I was like, I was talking about the carnivore diet. Like, how yes. is that, how is that like, how can you maintain that? Okay. I don't have, again, I'm not promoting this, but so, with all these questions of all the shortfalls and how can you do this long term and how can you eat and get nutrition by excluding these foods and you're losing your diversity and there are so many and there are other foods available that you can consume to round out your diet why don't these people do that that's kind of what a lot of you are asking right yeah okay so what if we talked about the vegan diet. Tell me about it. So that's like no animal product at all. Like mm -hmm. anything that comes from an animal, you can't eat it. No milk, no eggs, no cheese. Right. So, yeah. I would say I that did. there are, oh, you can go, you can continue. 
Oh, I was going to talk about, like, I did the vegan diet for, like, two months, and I I lost, like, all – I lost so much weight where I was, like, skin and bones. Like, I hated it. I had to stop after, like, one and a half months. Okay. And before we continue, thank you for sharing, Phyllis. I, I, let's say plant-based diet because uh, – let's just say plant-based. Basically, a plant-based – a vegan diet is a plant-based diet, but there are other people that are plant-based that don't say vegan, okay? So plant-based diet. I'm on a plant-based diet okay. for over a decade now. Um, okay. I feel great. Um, I do incorporate eggs sometimes, so not, not vegan, but mostly vegetarian. Okay. Um, would I say it's for everyone? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Um, but for some people, they, their bodies might thrive really, really well with that. Okay. Um, I know that there's lots of like athletes who do that, um, nowadays. So I think it's really, it just depends on the person and, um, and I think it benefits or I think it does. I, I feel like there's a lot of alternatives to like, um, protein in general. Like you could get it from, from actually like, what well, like tofu, right? um never tried it but i hear a lot about it like kind of has the same nutritional value as like uh chicken i think i really don't know don't take my word for this but but there are a lot of alternatives that you could like switch to but it's just you and, and your brain and if you want to adjust to it or not make this a lifetime thing okay anyone else personally i'm vegetarian as well uh, I mean, it's not obviously strictly plant-based like a vegan because I do have yogurt and cheese and egg, although not as often as I used to when I did eat meat. Uh, but I I feel great. I am not going back to meat. I have easier digestion. I don't feel bloated. I don't feel exhausted. Um, people are most surprised that I rarely eat salads, even though I'm vegetarian. And I did have that misconception as well, that it was going to be mostly like lettuce and salads, and I'm not into that. But okay. being vegetarian, I really don't eat salads as often. And I don't take any supplements whatsoever. And my blood is perfectly fine. Everything is is great. Like people think, oh, you're not going to have protein. You're not going to have iron, but there's iron and spinach and beans and plenty of protein as well. So I'm not deficient in any kind of way. So I'm not against it, if anything. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. I am a vegetarian and I love it. I feel pretty good. I have my energy levels. I get protein, obviously, as Nicole said, from other sources, from like beans, quinoa, also, it's really not for everyone. Obviously, if you like to eat meat, it's different, but I feel great. And I think it's a great alternative way to get your protein from, you know, legumes and grains. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yes. Like, is, does protein powder play in a role of, like, being vegan or vegetarian? Like, would you have to like switch to um like a vegan protein powder or something or like yeah you do mm -hmm. okay. i use um uh, there's so many but usually like pea protein hemp protein pumpkin protein there's mm -hmm. so many options and those are in powder forms like that yeah that adult, okay yeah uh because i that's, know people that's, typically that's use whey and that's a yeah. derivative of milk yeah right right thank okay. you okay Anyone else? I was vegan for like three years mm -hmm. and I had the like opposite effects as uh, like she did. Like my digestion was bad. My energy was bad. Like okay. everything. And I, I also had my um, blood tested and everything was fine. My levels are fine. Just my body just didn't work well with it, I guess. And then once I started incorporating like eggs, milk and like small, small amounts of meat, I like so way better like way better as soon as i started doing that so i guess it just depends on someone's body and like how like what they thrive off of i guess so because everyone's different but interesting all right let me ask you this does the this conversation feel differently than the carnivore diet conversation if it does how does what's different I feel like I feel like it's different because um, 
right off the bat, like when you brought up a plant-based diet, like we had um, Nicole uh, relate, we had Annie relate, um, you know, like it was easier to talk about the topic and it was easier to explain more. And plus like there's more prior knowledge behind it than this was my first time hearing about a carnivore diet. So I really wasn't able to, you know, unmute myself, talk, but you know, uh, plant-based, that's something like very common you know there's already like two or three people in here that uh, are following it currently mm -hmm. so i just feel like it it's it's towards like the prior knowledge that people had like the conversation just switched and it was like they knew more of it okay okay even yeah. though the only i'm sorry emily just one second even yeah. though gianna was the only person to provide well actually and nicole you well the guy's a doctor but there weren't you didn't refer to any papers but that was the closest to a scientific approach to an explanation. And the vegan diet was explained with experiences, right? Yeah. But it's close. Yeah. Um, I was just, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Emily. Me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I was just going to say when we were talking about the vegetarian or like plant based diet, it kind of had a it was geared toward more health and um, trying to be healthier. But when we were talking about the carnivore diet, it was kind of more of a negative connotation when we were talking about this. So I don't know if it's because there's more research um, about plant-based than just a carnivore diet, but when we were talking, it just had a more positive aspect to the conversation. I agree. It did, it did seem to have that kind of, that, that vibe to it, but they're both exclusion diets, aren't they? They are, but I feel with plant-based, you can get, I feel like you're getting more nutrients because you are eating fruits, vegetables, you know, legumes, grains, you're getting protein, you're getting fiber, you're getting all vitamins and minerals. You're just maybe lacking maybe iron and B12, you can get from a supplement. But not necessarily. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I then, agree. That yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I just think that there's just like a better variety in general than uh, just a carnivore diet, you know, just limiting yourself to one thing. So, yeah, I think there's a better variety of that. And they even have like the, um, like for being vegan and plant-based, they have like the impossible meat and stuff that tastes like meat. And it does actually like taste like meat. I tried it and I'm not vegan and I feel like it has that texture and everything. And it has some of the vitamins that they put in there for them to get the same that you're getting out of actual meat. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I think that um, the plant-based diet also gives you like a lot more options than say like the carnivore would. And like you're cutting out food groups when um, you go like all just carnivore and all meat. But aren't you missing out on meat and the energy density that you get from caloric density? Like, I, I'm just playing, uh, playing both sides here. So if you, and not the traditional, like, where are you going to get your protein from if you're a vegetarian? But uh, meat has a certain value, right? Like, calorically, you only have to eat a little bit to get a lot out of it. So, and there are also people that do could not care less about variety there are people in this world that have a goal and as long as it's not dangerous to the you know i mean there's eating disorders and i'm not getting into that i'm saying like there's you know there are people if you're an athlete or whatever it may be or if you're trying to do something you'll eat the same thing every day and it doesn't matter but that doesn't mean that you should do that so i guess what I hope that you realize is that for as much as you know about something or how you feel about something, there's someone that probably knows nothing or more than you about uh, the same topic or a different topic and has feelings just as strong for the opposite. If one of you was on a carnivore diet, do I think you would have stepped up and said, yeah, I tried it. I like it. Probably not right now. It's like a secret almost because it just seems so, it seems, it, go, it definitely goes against what's considered the norm, right? Like you don't wanna tell your friends. Whereas 
uh, plant-based seems to be more promoted and even on campus, do they still have, well, when we were all on campus, um, meatless Mondays, that was a thing, right? So to promote options to show you that you don't need meat, but what would happen if, you know, in the student center, it was meatless Mondays, but somewhere else it was, you know, just, if Taco Tuesday was just all meat with no, just just meat like Carnivore Day. People, do you think the campus overall would react fondly to that? Or would people just say, where's my vegetables and why are we promoting this? Or did I ask too many questions and you're not sure that you really, I really want you to answer um, any of them? I mean, there, there is going to be like a little bit of criticism. Like, like people are going to be like, yo, like, like where are my vegetables? And then you said like, um, carnivore days. And then you said, wait, what was the other day? Oh no. It's like, there's meatless Monday on campus. Oh, That's a meatless thing. oh that, oh, all right. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's, and then you're saying like, what if they had like a carnivore day? Uh huh. Um, I, I really don't think, I, I kind of don't think anybody would really react that crazy if there already is like a meatless one, like a meatless day, you know what I mean? Okay. So if like, if there's like a carnival day, I really don't, like the percentage of like, I mean, I'm guessing I'm really not following like a chart or anything, but people who eat meat, like it's a, it's a higher percentage of people who don't just based off like information, like around me. So I really don't think like the campus and the, and like the students would react that crazy towards like a day like that. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I'm kind of tempted to to start one just as a, a, a just as an experiment <laughs> to see what happens. Uh, <laughs> Emily, you wanted to share something? Yeah, I was just gonna I was just gonna say that just with like the vegan diet or the vegetarian diet, if you were to say I was doing this like I don't know 15 years ago, it maybe would have seemed like crazy, but mm -hmm it was had, um, I don't know, less research about it or, and less people were doing it. So if you were to add carnivore day, I think it's just something that people would have to get used to. Or I'm not saying that it's good, but I'm saying that it's something that people would just maybe get used to and then, or accept if there was more research eventually over mm -hmm. time. That's it. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like the, the carnivore diet is like up and coming, just like mm -hmm. the vegetable diet or like the vegan diet was like years ago so I feel like people don't know as much about it now because like we have statistics and we have facts and we have data and stuff but like I feel like it's not like out there yet like I feel like also growing up like I grew up eating meat but I feel like because like my family on one side like my grandpa's side like we have like they have like heart problems like a lot of them have like heart diseases so they always said that eating a lot of red meat was not good for you it was not good for your arteries and was not good for your heart so like even though I knew that, like I still ate it when I was younger, but like st still, like I feel like people kind of stray away from it because there's kind of like a, like a negative connotation about it. Like I still eat meat, but I don't eat it as much as I used to. Cause like I eat more plant-based stuff now. Cause I had like a pro I had like a thyroid problem months ago and I lost like 40 pounds based off of the plant-based diet. Like I was eating more plant-based stuff, but I was also throwing meat in there. But that's, that's why I knew that doctor, because I was trying to figure out, do I do, do I do keto? Do I do carnivore diet? Like, do I do vegan? Like, what do I do? But the plant-based was definitely more common. So that's what I knew. Like, that's what I, I went more towards. I gravitated towards it. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? I guess in general, like we're all trying to say that there needs to be a balance. So to just have one, I guess, extreme, there's just naturally going to be criticism, like Islam said, because it's kind of like, where's the variation? Where's the balance to this? I want this and I want that. Um, although I guess you're going to find the people who are plant-based or who are just liking me, they're going to be perfectly fine because that's more of the spectrum and that they're gravitating towards regardless but there's just if you have balance then in general people are going to be more happy true true that could work for most people um the th interesting thing about heart disease and saturated fats and things like that like obviously 
the research is showing or has shown and it's been around for a long time so it's not it's i wouldn't say it's made up but it is there are people that have consumed things that you would consider to be questionable for large portions of their life and are still perfectly fine you know um i guess an example could be uh like you know if someone doesn't have food if you can't afford food and all you eat is like butter because it's so calorically dense and that's all that you consume and you're still at a calorie deficit are you going to develop heart disease i mean you might but you probably won't but no one will but the common perception is that that's insane and that you're going to die because you're eating all that butter, right? And I wouldn't recommend a diet that's only butter anyway. But the things to remember is that no matter what you're eating, it's the, it's the chemistry of it, the biochemistry, what's happening in your body, what's happening in your blood. Your blood tells the story. How you feel also tells the story, you know? That's, that's the difference. So uh, who in the class is in this class with hopes to one be one day be a registered dietitian. Me. All right, so I see a lot of hands up. Okay. You don't have to take this advice. It could go in one ear out the other, but based on what I've seen in my years of doing this, to be the best at understanding nutrition, you want to understand as much as you can about biochemistry. What happens to the foods when they're in your body? If you're talking to someone and they want to try something, whatever the diet is, what, you know, they want to try these foods or not these foods, what do they need? How many, how many vitamins and minerals does that person need? How many grams of protein and fat and carbohydrates and at which time does that person that you're dealing with your client need to keep them healthy? the better you are with the mechanics of understanding that i think the better off you're going to be as a registered dietitian now this is coming from someone that studied it but i didn't take medical nutrition therapy that was the one class i didn't take and i didn't go for my uh dietetic internship so i don't claim to be a diet expert i actually am uh relieved that i can talk about it without being in in it you know, just from, from the side that I'm on. And I, I, I think it makes a big difference. And part of it, and we'll talk about where they came from, like the daily recommended intakes, daily recommended allowance, you know, do you know where those numbers came from? Like how much vitamin A do we need a day? How many grams of protein should we have a day? How many carbohydrates should we have in a day? experiments like they, they took people and like i guess you would hope right but once upon a time they just collected data a lot of it is based on um you know in the 1950s or earlier your people seem relatively healthy what do you normally eat in a day and again don't take my word for it research this look into it okay but some of it will be surprising at how you learn these things and you have to memorize them for tests and other classes to be able to regurgitate these facts, which are just based on the uh, co information that was easy to collect at the time. Similar to BMI, body mass index. Are you familiar with that? So what is body mass index? It's your like muscle mass to fat ratio i believe like your weight to height also and i don't know how to right so it. i just I thought i'd calculate all that essentially what you're trying to say is it tells you how much body fat you have or how like if you're obese normal weight overweight underweight right that's what the bmi tells us we only need two numbers to calculate bmi what are they your height, um, your height and weight and weight your height so if there is a five foot tall 
bodybuilder who's about to go on a competition stage and has 3%, 3% body fat and weighs 220 pounds, they're going to have the same BMI as someone that has, you know, I don't, I can't even, has basically, you know, uh, just, a lot of body fat, essentially, but they're five feet tall and they weigh the same. Their, their body composition is greatly different, but the B, according to the BMI, they're the same. So it's a flawed measurement, but why do we still use it? Would that go the same for a person's BMR? The basal metabolic rate is the BMR. No, that varies from person to person. So you would assume that the higher the muscle mass of a person, because muscle is more metabolically active, they would require more calories to power that machine, so to speak. So a BMR would be different. And that is based on the, the individual, mm -hmm. which is a good question. And that's what's upsetting about the BMI is because it, it, it's, it's two easy numbers. Maybe waist hip ratio would tell you more about because if abdominal obesity is related to heart disease and you're trying to assess populations, maybe that's a better measurement. But if you're looking at large populations, you know, in numbers, not in size necessarily, the height and weight is easy to get. You step on a scale, measure your height, done. Instead of measuring your hips and measuring your waist. So, as you progress throughout your career, if you're gonna do a survey of anyone or do some type of study, try to keep BMI off of it. It's gonna be harder, but it's a, it's, it doesn't really mean much to us anymore. But there's a lot of things like that that are kind of just common and just used regularly, which don't really, they don't really tell us exactly what we think they're telling us. And in some of the, when you do your paper on the food product, you're going to, the one thing is uh, at least 10 sources. Because I want you to look at current research to find out what the information is. So things can change. What things are today could change by tomorrow. In the next five years, we're, you're probably going to be learning more about, or the articles you read about and go to conferences about are going to be on gut health, you know? The gut microbiome, we know a little bit now, but we're gonna learn more. And that's gonna be a big deal. Um, will the carnivore diet be debunked? Who knows? Will there be more information? That, um, I, I could try to find the papers, but I've heard talks that one doctor in particular was trying, again, don't, I'm not saying this to be scientifically a fact because I need to look further, but what, he's trying to say is when you eat only meat you don't need as much you don't need as many vitamins and minerals you don't need as much fiber you don't need as many of these things but it's hard to prove because we don't have sample sizes that are large enough at enough time and there aren't as many people that are willing to do it so that's kind of one tangent that i that i went on but to bring it back is don't just accept the information that your friends are telling you. Question what you see on social media. If you see someone posting, I just followed this diet and look, look at how I look now. I wouldn't really believe too much about that. Look at the current research. And the more you do that, the more of an expert you're going to be in your field. Because that's what makes you a diff different than the Instagram dietitian that just says, all right, now... Now I'm a coach, I'll give you a meal plan. Just pay me whatever per month. And that person has zero education. Do you know what it takes to be, to consider yourself a nutritionist? Compared to, so you know what it takes to be a registered dietitian. You need a degree, which now you need a master's degree and you need to complete the internship and you need to complete the exam, right? That's a lot of school. Do you know what it takes to become a nutritionist? What? Do you want to share, Ashley? Doesn't it like you don't have to do anything? You just like call yourself one, I think? Yes, you just need to be able to spell nutritionist or even just put in a spell check. That's it. 
if you want to be a nutritionist, oh, I'm a nutritionist now. It doesn't require anything. So the people that speak the loudest and are, you know, well perceived don't always know what they're talking about. So there's a lot of research and a lot of information that goes into separating you from, from the rest. Um, one of the things to get back to it that I want to talk about uh, throughout the semester is the chemical processes that actually happen. So just to make sure you have a good basis of that aspect. So no matter what the food is that you're consuming, it's what's happening in your body at that time. Okay. Uh, let's see. Should we take a five minute break or just go right through? We have about another half hour. Right through. All right, if you need to, actually, you know what? I'm gonna take a break for two minutes. If you need to, go ahead. We'll do a quick one, all right?
All right, so we're still waiting for a few people to come back online. I'll give it another minute. So we talked a lot about food choices and a little bit about how the choices came to be. We all know everybody eats and everyone chooses different foods. So how that comes to be is pretty important. And to go back to the dietitian thing, uh, psychology comes into it as well, because a lot of times or many times it could happen if there's someone that uh, especially with under or overeating, if you just, you could prescribe the perfect diet to that person, but if it doesn't address the how and the why uh, of what they're consuming, then you're not going to send, deliver the whole message as effectively as it could be. So that's something to, to keep in mind. But I want to show you a video that has to do a little bit about food choices. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen again. So you should all see Chrome now, right? Yes, okay, very good, thank you. So here's the module. This is the homepage, so modules, it's August 31st. I'm going to play this video clip. So all this should be, it's posted live in Canvas right now. Or it's actually posted For this next right experiment, now. food expert Eric Trinidad has whipped up several batches of brownies. Three brownies here. To see what will or won't catch people's eye. Can I interest you in some brownies? It's a new <laughs> recipe I'm trying. All right. Eric is telling people he's perfecting a new brownie mix. I was kidding. For a baker. How's the volume? Can everyone hear the video okay? Yes? Okay, thank you. Curry, he's opened in the area. Take your pick. And even though these brownies come in lots of different shapes, from a traditional square to a foot, or even one that looks like a hockey puck, all of them are made from the same ingredients. Except these brownies, which are made with premium chocolate for an even richer taste. Will they be able to see past the outer differences and give the alternative brownies a try? Let's see how people react to Eric's tasty creations. I think I'm gonna go with this one. I'm gonna go number one, traditional. Go for it. Now, is there a reason why you chose the particular shapes that you chose? Well, this one was shaped like a fleur de lis, so uh -huh. it just looks really cute. Right. The rest of them don't look like brownies. Can I interest you in the number two? That's so not gonna happen. <laughs> Go ahead, try it. No. I'm giving away free samples of my new recipe. What? What is that? That is a brownie like the recipe. Oh, that That's is not a brownie. Show, right? That's <laughs> gross. What about you at home? Are you turned off by the shape of this brownie? No one's going to want that. Or do you think they're being a little dramatic? That is just wrong. After all, it's just a brownie. So why are people willing to eat the ones shaped like flowers or hockey pucks or even a foot, yet they refuse to try this one, even after we told them it's made from premium chocolate? What goes through your head when I offer you this one? I know it's food, but my brain is saying, don't eat that. And that's the point. Almost everyone got hung up on the shape of the brownies except for this brave soul, who threw caution to the wind. Are you gonna kiss me with that mouth? Mm -hmm. That was really good. Obviously, that was a pretty ex Okay. So, who would have tried the doo-doo brownie? Anybody? Yeah? So the appearance makes a difference, right? People are not gonna eat something that looks like something else, even though it's a brownie. Which yeah, I think it's like what's that? Yeah, I think it like I think it like clicks in your brain that uh, like even if you do eat it, um, there's still like a perception that it's like not good, so they'll probably like not like it either way. I don't know. Like I didn't try the brownie myself, but I wouldn't have tried it just because of like the shape and everything. <laughs> just because of the shape. 
Yeah. Would it have made a difference if that was the only brownie shape there compared to the others? Um, I don't know. I have probably, I don't know. Probably not, I guess. Probably not. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Anyone else? I think it would. Yeah. Yeah. Because like he showed four different like shapes, but mm -hmm. if he was just to show that one shape and he would say like, this is a brownie, you know what I mean? And he'll be like, this is a brownie. And that would be the only shape. I think they would try it because that's the only thing there and it's a free sample. There you go. So, okay. So they're, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Like he offered them at the beginning, like it's a free sample, but four different kinds. Right now you're letting them choose what's free, like which, which are the free samples. But if you just told them that this is a free sample and this is the only brownie you get, they'll, they'll definitely take it. That's just. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah, I agree with Islam because like people eat hot dogs and that's a weird shape. So what's the difference between this being a weird shape too? True, true. Okay, that's a good point. Good point. Um, anyone else? I would find it amusing. Find it amusing. Okay. <laughs> I'll try it. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, All this right. looks fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So basically a lot of... There are many different influences on our food choices and a lot of it just comes back to our senses and i'm going to show you a few slides about some of the choices and the reasons why so just bear with me one second please okay so Everyone can see the slideshow, PowerPoint. All right, cool, thanks. I'm only gonna ask that every single time because I'm paranoid now that no, no one can see it. But uh, all right, so of all the choices we can make, food, food scientists wanna know why people eat, what people eat, and what food characteristics are the most uh, enticing to customers. So why people eat is kind of a silly question, right? Because at its most basic reason, like everyone knows why we eat, but it's more nuanced than that. Uh, do you know anyone that eats when they're stressed? Do you know anyone that won't eat when they're stressed? Do you know someone that eats when they're bored? Or something, you know what I mean? Like there's so many things, because you assume, or the basics are, you eat because you're hungry and you need and you eat because that's the only way to get or that's the only way without medical intervention to get the nutrition that we need, the nutrients into our bodies, right? So why we eat? And that's important from a food scientist standpoint because uh, when you know why, you learn how to manipulate that to sell something to someone that they may need or they may not need, but to get people to eat things when they're not even hungry, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, you also tend to eat like when you're surrounded by food as well, like the um, your surroundings too. Right, right. When you're surrounded by food, but what about when you're surrounded by people? If everybody's eating, are you going to eat or are you not going to eat? Yeah, yeah you, you most likely would tend to eat, yeah. Okay. Years ago, I was following, I mean, it wasn't really that strict. It was just like macro based, but I made all my own meals. So for basically six months, I would say 95% of my meals were meals that I made. Which meant when my friends went out to a restaurant and I went with them, I'd have an unsweetened iced tea or, or whatever it was and sit there. How do you think my friends took it? Probably like made fun of you made something. fun of me relentlessly they were yeah. uncomfortable they told all the wait staff that i was a uh, recovering alcoholic because i didn't wouldn't have a drink with them they uh, also got uncomfortable you ever not eat in front of buddy and have you ever eaten a meal in front of a friend and it's healthier than their meal and then what what yeah. happens do you ever have someone say like, well, I know I need to fix my diet too. Does that ever happen to you? 
or they'll they'll try to bring you like they'll try to bring you down and they're like yo dude like you're always hard on yourself like why are you always doing this like like it won't hurt for a piece of cake like they'll try to also bring you down because of their failure in trying to become a, a better version like a better body like and stuff like that like they'll just be like dude just have a have a snickers bro like it's not gonna hurt you right and it, it really kind of will because that's that's kind of you know calorie heavy you know what i mean of course of course but what if what if you're someone that has so there's a perception that people deserve these treats or you've earned these treats and I, but they're but what about someone that is, that has diabetes? If they worked hard and deserve a reward and they give themselves a Snickers bar, what's going to happen? You either have to put, you have to inject yourself with more insulin. Like the reward system for food kind of is diminished. If you have to follow a diet where eating certain foods that are considered like rewards or treats could be dangerous to you. So if you take that one step further, then how did this become something that people do anyway? It's basically just the culture of food and your environment and the cycle, you know, it's your social circle, social groups, that it all comes into play. Yeah, I'd say so too. Cause like, like my family is like Italian, so they really love to eat and stuff. So if you're not like eating enough, then, uh, they'll like comment on it and like try to give you more and more and stuff. So of course, of course I used to spend the summertime, uh, you know, while my parents were working by my grandmother's house. So it's like, I just, I, all right, go swimming. All right. You're done swimming. You want lunch? All right, here's lunch. And it's like, you want a snack? You hungry? You did a good job. I'll make you pasta. You feel sad. I'll make you pasta. You want food? You don't want to eat? I don't, uh, how am I supposed to show you that I love you if I can't feed you? Yeah. And they think that you don't like their food either. If, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't eat it. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Uh, so getting into the sensory criteria, like we talked about with that, uh, doo doo brownie. And I just think it's funny to say doo doo sometimes. And some of you chuckle and others are like, all right, move on. So we have sight, odor, taste, touch, and hearing. Of these senses, which do you think is the one that we rely on, that we use first when we assess a food? It's really hard. Like, it's, like, it's kind of hard between sight and odor because sometimes, like, something smells so good that you can't really see it. Like, you could just, like, your mom could be making it in the kitchen. But, like say you're at a restaurant you're like oh damn like that looks good like you don't even smell it so i would say between the two but it's really hard to choose right okay anyone else no okay so basically according to the text the the sense even though we can detect odor from greater distances the sense that we rely on first before we consume something when we decide if we're going to put this in our mouth or not is sight okay that's why i showed you the video of those brownies because just by looking at them people said i'm not eating that so sight is the first thing what do you think is the sense that keeps people coming back to a certain food Taste. Taste? Right. If there's something that looks good, but when you bite into it, you're like, yeah, this isn't so good. Are you going to keep eating that uh, over and over again? Maybe if we were one dimensional, like <laughs> on a piece of paper and it's just the appearance. Sure. But no, it's so after, if you like the flavor of something, you like the taste, you're sometimes the appearance doesn't matter as much. But sight is first, and what keeps you coming back is, is the taste. So let's move on. Um, so in terms of the sense of smell, there's volatile molecules basically 
Who can tell me what volatile, volatile means? It's a, it says it right here. There are mo molecules that are basically like gas in the air. Volatile means it's in the air. So they're going up your nostrils and you're sensing them and that's it. So olfactory is related to the sense of smell. And smell and taste go together to give you flavor. So once upon a time, the taste stimuli that you can perceive on your tongue was sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. And that was it. It just stopped there. And that's what was in the text. That's what was in the textbooks when I was younger. Then you learn, oh, wait a second. Now there's savory, which is different than salty because it has like a meaty flavor to it. And that's from a glutamate or monosodium glutamate adds like a meaty flavor. So savory or umami. And now there's an even newer, the new new taste stimuli is oleogustus, which is a taste for fat. Okay. So six taste stimuli. Again, flavor is taste plus aroma. If you lose the ability to detect the aroma, you're going to have decreased flavor, right? If your taste buds aren't working and you can just smell the food, you're going to have decreased flavor have you ever noticed this if you're congested if if you can't really breathe uh through your nose and then you're trying to eat a food that doesn't taste as good like when you have a cold it's like all you want to do when you uh when you have a, a cold is just eat some food that makes you feel better and you can't even taste it other times you know uh age is a big factor the older you get the less um you're able to perceive these things. Also temperature, the temperature of food ha has, a, has a, um, an impact as well. So an example of this is food that is cold, you won't be able to taste the flavor as much. Have you ever experienced this? So if, you, if you're cooking something, Say if you're doing meal prep, I know some of you said your friends or family members do meal prep. If you season your food when it's hot, the way that you prefer it when it's hot, if you take that in a cooler and go throughout your day and you eat your food cold, it's going to be more bland because the cold food doesn't have as much flavor. So it uh, doesn't have as much taste. You can't perceive it because the volatilized, there's no volatilized uh, molecules. So you're losing that aroma. That's part of it. Okay. So temperature is a factor. Factors for touch, you know, texture, consistency. Oh, let's go back to this one. Chemesthesis. Chemesthesis, aside from being a tricky word to say uh, over and over again, is something that you probably have all experienced before have for those of you that are over the age of 21 have you ever uh what's that um actually i forget now fireball that's a cinnamon alcohol right okay what does it feel like in your mouth or like a cinnamon hot candy do you feel heat Yes, have you ever tried this before? Like, yeah. Okay, or if you've eaten um, hot peppers, you feel heat, right? If you stuck a thermometer in your mouth, would the temperature of your mouth go up after eating this food or while you're eating the food? No, no it wouldn't. So it's the perception of a temperature change. This also happens with um have you ever bitten into a mint or you eat a mint or a peppermint and then you inhale or exhale and it mm -hmm. feels like you could just blow 
uh, you could turn people into ice cubes or something. Some kind of like, yeah. who's that storm from X Men and maybe like uh, Elsa kind of hybrid if just eating the uh, peppermints. So that cool feeling, it's also not making your mouth colder. The temperature is the same, but you perceive this change in temperature. So chemesthesis is just that perceived change in temperature that's in your mouth. And the examples are like the, the hot cinnamon candy that makes your mouth feel hot or the uh, peppermint that makes your mouth feel cold. So hot soup would not be an example because that actually is hot in your mouth. And cold ice cream wouldn't be an example because that actually is cold, right? So it changes the temperature. So that might be something, if you haven't realized by now, kind of, if I go over something that much, it's probably going to be a question on the test. Okay? So also, um, even though for the live sessions you're expected to be here, I'm going to record everything anyway, and I'm going to, like, this session is being recorded. So at the end, I just post them all to Canvas. So you can go back to look at the previous recordings and try to figure out, well, just review and you can kind of get a sense for the topics that may make it to the quiz at the end. Okay. So you'll have, you'll have all those to review throughout the semester. Yes. Heads. Head hey, where, do you, okay. um, uh, where do you access, like, you know how um, you're like, you're recording this right now and then you're going to upload it to canvas. Yes. Like, where do you upload that? Or like, where can you see it? I will put it, I'm going to put it probably in a module that says previous, that's called previous class recordings or something okay. to that effect. And the first one I do, I'll put an announcement through Canvas that just says, and I'll link the module folder in the announcement. Does that make yeah. sense? Was there someone else or I thought I heard something? Yeah, I just, I, you were, I was letting you finish. I don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I was just going to ask if you also are going to post the slides and where. So the slides, the slides that I'm going over right now are already posted. Okay. Thank you. They're in the module called uh, 831. So it'll go by the date. Okay. Um, is it easier? Actually, I just thought, is it easier if I just put the recording for today in the module for today? So that way you have all the slides and the recording in one place. That module already exists. So is that easier to organize for everybody? Does anyone feel strongly that it should not be done that way? I'm just looking at it. Uh, please speak up if you feel it should not be done that way. So basically you either are cool with that or it is what it is and you don't really, you're not really that concerned. All right, so I'm gonna put the recording in the module folder that's called 831. And just to recap, that is located So if you if you're looking here's the home page actually let me do this So this is student view this is what you see basically right Looks similar So if you go to modules and this should be there we go 831 So there's going to be a module for each week so you just open this up so if you look, that's where the clip for the video was, the brain games. We're going over PowerPoint number one right now. And there's all this other information here, okay? There's also the syllabus review, but added to this, I'm going to have the recording for today. Yes? Okay. Stop share. All right. Um, this we don't really need to worry about. My plate, when I was in 
school the first time, it was a food pyramid with a person running up the side of the food pyramid to show that activity is needed. What always fascinated me was they would show this in class, like in 190, nutrition with the lab. You'd learn about my plate or the food pyramid and how you should follow this. But the next slide is the Mediterranean diet with all the positive effects due to the, um, you know, polyunsaturated fats and all the healthy oils. It's like, well, why are we recommending this if this other one is better? But anyway, um, so something to remember, like fortified foods and enriched foods. Let's see. So fortified means that there is something in the product that it's not there naturally. Like calcium fortified orange juice. Do oranges naturally have as much calcium as milk? No, but when you add, but you can add calcium to it and all of a sudden now you don't need to drink milk anymore because you're getting all your calcium from your orange juice. Also, iodized salt. Why is iodine important? For your thyroid. For your thyroid, yes, yes. So um, the decision was made many years ago to add iodine to salt because everybody uses salt. Something that you want to be careful of if you're only using sea salts like pink Himalayan sea salt and all the the there's probably 25 different kinds of fancy salt that everyone's using right now if it's not iodized then you need to make sure that you're getting iodine in your diet from somewhere else okay so fortified is basically building up a product to make it better than it was before. It did not have these things in it. Now they're added. Enrichment is different. Enrichment can be like uh, all purpose flour or cereals. It's typically in green. So basically when you process all purpose flour, you strip away everything. So you have to add back what was lost during processing. So the folate, niacin, all that good stuff, okay? So enriching is adding back what was removed, what was there already, they're just putting it back in. Everyone understands? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, bioengineering, something that's interesting um have you heard of the lab grown meat it's not popular yet it's still very expensive i don't think it's widely distributed but there is meat that is grown in a lab it's not plant-based it's actual meat so just something to uh to think about there gmo stands for genetically modified organisms so a lot of times genetically modified organisms, the plants are, um, you'd think that they have like some type of superpower, but it's pretty boring with what they're usually modified for. One product, does anyone, uh, can, can you tell me a GMO product? Can you think of any examples? Most I'm sorry, I, what is it? I heard two people, but what, what'd you say? I said seedless watermelon. Seedless watermelon, okay. And then there was another one. I was gonna say probably most of the fruits that are at your local grocery store. Well, they're not. So there's a difference between genetically modifying and selective 
uh, breeding, right? So we have all the different varieties of apples that we have because the people that run the orchards took different parts, you know, I'm gonna take uh, this piece of this apple tree and put it into this apple tree and we're gonna make a different flavor apple. So that's not really genetically modified. Also, um, like people say, like chickens, uh, like a yeah. roaster chicken, a Purdue chicken, that chicken now is about the size of what turkeys used to be 50 to 75 years ago. They're not genetically modified. They just use selective breeding to get the biggest possible that they can. Um, the watermelons that are seedless, that, that could be, there's also, there were tomatoes that were supposed to last longer, the flavor saver tomato, which didn't really uh, go over too big. One of the, some of the more popular ones now uh, are corn, genetically modified corn. And like I said, it's not really for anything exciting. It's modified so that it has a super high resistance to pesticides. Why would we want our corn or why would the people that are using GMO or why would someone want corn to be resistant to pesticides? So that bugs are not eating them, which is not a loss of product and profit for the farmers because they're not losing the crop so they can actually sell it. Right, right. So if, they're, if the corn is resistant to the pesticides, you can add a lot of pesticide to your cornfield so that any bug or animal that comes near it is just going to drop dead and not eat your corn and take your money away from you. So that's what it was modified for. Um, organic, basically there's, we could go over the labeling, but there's different things that say it, it could be 100% organic or made with organic ingredients, which is not the same. Basically, this should be the most expensive and this should be the least expensive if you're buying something in a store. So to be considered 100% organic, all ingredients are certified organic. If it's just organic, 95%, and then made with organic ingredients, 70%, and then contains organic ingredients is less than 70% of finished products meet the criteria. Okay. So I'm just looking at the comments. Okay, so you know what? The comments that you say to each other, I'm going to treat them as if it was a discussion that you would have between each other in class. So unless there's something that's harmful to someone, I'm not really gonna even get into it. So if we're talking about my fitness pal or I tried this and it works and it doesn't, I'm not gonna even, if you want me to respond, just bring it to my attention. How's that sound? Good? Okay. Um, so, um, yes. So where would you find um, like that on like a, a product uh, on how much organic materials in it? Like would so, you find it like nutritional, like the label? Yeah, or? normally you would see it in the ingredient statement. And if they're 100 percent organic typically there's a fee associated with that mm. so they're going to pay you know they paid a lot to get their organic certification so you'll have that 100 percent organic mm. stamp somewhere on there okay. and then if it's just made with organic ingredients or some percentage other than 100 percent organic they would say the word organic in front of each ingredient in the ingredient statement mm -hmm. How, how many of you read ingredient labels 
when you uh, are purchasing products. Me. So a lot of you, a lot of you. Okay. And has, what are some things on the label that made you put a product back on the shelf and look for something else? Well, like I, I'm a Muslim, so like I can't eat pork. So anything gelatin product, like say like it's gummy bears, uh, damn, she got gelatin, I gotta put it right back, look for something else. Okay. I have hypoglycemia. Uh -huh. uh, so for people who don't know, it's pretty much like the opposite of a diabetic. My sugars run really low. So I uh, look, you know, I read the ingredients for sugar content, the glucose and all of that stuff I avoid. So I like dried fruit. And for whatever reason, a lot of times people are adding sugars to dried raisins and a bunch of preservatives. So I put it back because I'm like, it's already sweet and it's already preserved because you dried it. I don't understand why you're adding all this other stuff. So that's one of my things that is a pet peeve for me. Okay. Anyone else? I feel like too much, like if it has too much salt in it, cause like me, I cook all the time. So I like to add my own salt and whatever. So I don't like stuff that has too much salt. Cause I feel like then I can't do what I want to do with it because it's already salty. Okay. So you want to put the finishing touches on the masterpiece, not... Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, for me, I used to look at, for dried fruit, if it had a lot of sulfur dioxide, I, I just... It's just one of those things, like, I would try to avoid excess sulfur, but um, that was a phase. Now I don't really, you know... Um, but like I started to say at the beginning of the class, it really, some products are marketed as the best thing in the world. But when you really look at the ingredients, they're cutting some corners or it could be perceived to cut some corners. I guess one example could be, so Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers. Without looking at taste, just by the ingredients, which one's better? Beyond. Okay. Uh, what makes you say Beyond is better? And if for those of you that aren't sure, just we'll just do a quick uh, search for Beyond and Impossible. Look at the ingredients. Going off what I've heard, because I haven't tried either one of them, but I've heard the like the Impossible Burger is pretty pretty terrible. <laughs> oh well. Okay, so some people might like them, but just going by the ingredients. Right, no, I mean, I mean terrible um, ingredient-wise. Okay. Um, Beyond has pea protein, right? Right. I believe. And Impossible has soy protein. In the plant-based protein hierarchy, soy has a pretty bad reputation, right? So why would Impossible use it? Could it be the texture, the behavior, the mouthfeel? Or is it also the, the cost, the cost of the soy to use? So pea protein, if you look, you'll probably see that pea protein is more costly. Which should mean that Beyond, which uses the pea protein, would be a, it costs more to make that product. So it should be a little bit more premium. Did anyone find anything contrary to that? Or confirming that? Same thing, basically? Okay. Again, it all comes down to your choice. You're gonna eat the one that tastes better to you. If, that, if that's what you want to do, right? But that's, that's just, that's one of those things. That's one of those things. Also, um, this used to be an old, I forget the brand of ice cream. It might be Breyer's ice cream. 
but their commercial used to be kids reading the ingredient statement on their ice cream carton and then trying to read the ingredient statement on another brand. So ice cream is a thing that there aren't many things that are in ice cream shaped cartons in the freezer section of your supermarket that are actually ice cream. A lot of them, if you look at the label, they're called a frozen, frozen dessert. Yeah, frozen dairy product. And the reason for that is they don't meet the standard of identity. So they might not have as much milk fat. Ice cream itself has a specific amount of fat in it from milk. And if you don't have that, you can't call it ice cream. So if you're doing it for dietary reasons, that's not a big deal. It's a frozen dessert and you're purchasing this product because it has a lower fat probably. Um, but if you're trying to market your ice cream and you're just not putting as much milk fat in because it's saving you money, you can't just sell that to people because it's fraud. So you have to, you can't call it ice cream because it's not. Um, so sometimes if there's a lot of ingredients that don't need to be in a product, a lot of, you know, I, I might put that back on a shelf, but there are also the other part of this ingredient project or a food project that I want you to realize is there are certain things that are not bad. Certain names that sound like a dangerous chemical, it's just a thickener that without it, you wouldn't be able to have that food product. So if you don't, where at whatever level you're at now of ingredient knowledge and why they're in foods, the goal is to elevate that, okay? Um, with that, let me just do, I'm gonna show you one more quick slideshow and then I think we're gonna be done for the day. So I'm gonna share. All right, so food evaluation. We're gonna talk about uh, sensory evaluation. Do you prefer A or B? So these are hot sauces, right? So the reason why we're doing this is say, theoretically, that this class, we were gonna go into business together and we were gonna market a hot sauce to Montclair State University students and then other students in the surrounding area. But we need to know what kind of sauce to make. Do we want to make it a thick sauce or like a thinner sauce? Everyone with me so far? So this is the sensory evaluation. This is, these are people evaluating the, the products. So sample A. We're looking at the viscosity preference. And viscosity is the resistance to flow. So basically, you could think of it of how thick a product is, but it's the resistance to flow is what viscosity is. Now we have sample B. So look at that one compared to the to sample A. Okay, of those two, which one would you say has a higher viscosity? B. Sample B, does everyone agree? Yep. Yes, okay, very good. Yes, yeah, sample B has a higher viscosity. So let's go to the next slide. And this is just looking from the side, sample A spread out, sample B is kind of stacked up on itself. So that's more resistance to flow. And even though this is just a sheet of white paper, uh, viscosity tests oftentimes are done just by, it's sometimes it's a piece of plastic that has lines like graph paper and you pour a product on and you just measure how far it spreads out. Or you could put like a little um, immersion blender in it and it picks up the resistance. But again, viscosity 
is the resistance to flow. You could also think about it as uh, being thicker. The higher viscosity, the thicker something is. So what does our group, so in our class, what, what do we think? What do we prefer? Do we want hot sauce that is like sample A or like sample B? I like A. <laughs> a? I like a nice thick sauce. Mm -mm. <laughs> is that, well, it depends on what sauce is. Is that hot yeah. sauce, like you said? All right, right, these are hot sauces. So let's say sample yeah. A is Frank's Red Hot, sample B is Sriracha. Yeah, no, nah, I think a, a looks like ketchup. I don't know. It's a little <laughs> sus. I can tell you what they are because I did this in my kitchen a couple of years ago. <laughs> so this is this is hot Frank's Red Hot. This is Sriracha. So we're kind of mixed, right? We're kind of not sure if we want to make uh, a a highly viscous sauce or a less viscous sauce, right? Since we're selling it to Montclair State students, we should kind of ask them. So what we would do is do a survey to ask them or like um, food panels and have people come into a room and look at sample A and sample B and just say, which hot sauce would you like better? Not even on taste, just on appearance. Do you like a thin one or a thick one? So we would assess that, right? So that's the sensory evaluation. Everyone says, you know what? I, we, we say we polled 100 people and 75 said they like sample A, the Frank's Red Hot style hot sauce. So that's the sensory or subjective analysis. So when you think of subjects, Think of people like we're the subject, right? For sen and we have senses, so we're doing a sensory evaluation. So all the, the people say they prefer the thinner sauce, the Frank's Red Hot, Red Hot style. What happens then is this gets changed into object analysis. What that means is we now know that we want a sauce that's this viscosity, this this desired thinness right is everyone with me so far okay so we so we're going to make a th our first batch we have to make uh 1000 bottles because that's what the factory that's their minimum requirement so we have to make 1000 bottles of this hot sauce what we want to do and that's the objective testing is establish what this viscosity actually is so that when we create the formula we know that our recipe because we can't just bottle frank's red hot our hot sauce we want it to have the same viscosity the same thinness the same flow so we need to figure we need to define this number so us using our senses us as the subjects need to turn this object to come up with an actual hard data point what is the actual viscosity number so we established that and then we can test each batch of so we establish that we create our recipe right so a thousand bottles are going to look like this so that way every time it's produced, it's the same. And I say, why go through all this trouble to replicate the original? Okay, so basically you wanna go through all this trouble to make sure it's the same viscosity in every bottle because your brand uh, for quality reasons is that's your product and people expect it a certain way. Just imagine if you opened a bottle of ketchup and poured it out and it came out looking like cookie crumbs or it came out flowing like water like you would say something's wrong with this, right? When I was a kid, once upon a time, um, I don't know if this brand is still around. It was called like Sips, I think like S-S-I-P-S, the juice boxes. And we had like the fruit punch ones, but 
I stuck my straw in, I went to sip it and it didn't taste right. So naturally as a child, I had a perfectly calm, even response. I spit it out all over the floor. I said, there's something wrong with this. Then I poured it into a glass and it was brown. Like, what is this? This is supposed to be fruit punch. So what I think happened is they must have switched from the fruit punch to, they must have run iced tea and not flushed the lines before they filled the fruit punch. So there was a color difference. There was a taste difference. That, so I didn't want to ever drink sips again because I was like, what, what, what am I going to get? You know, it could have been iced tea. It could have been bleach. It could have been sanitizer. I don't, I don't know. Um, so it's that, it's the repetition, the, the same product every single time when you're a food manufacturer. So people know when they pick the product off of the shelf, that bottle that they get is going to be as good as the one that they bought before and the next one that they're going to buy and that they don't. Here's another thing. When you go to the supermarket, do you pick up the first bottle in the front of the line or do you reach a little further in the back? Anybody? Or am I speaking like a... Um, I'm a little Maybe the in the back. I reach further back. Yeah. What makes the bottles in the back better than the ones in the front? I don't know. They're just like not... Tamed. They're newer. Less people have touched them. Less people have stared at them maybe yeah, uh, there's no some, there's something it's something that a lot of people do bottle but it's behind like, the first one <laughs> what's that? Yeah. i said there's something comforting about the, bo the bottle behind the first one i don't know why bottle but it's protected it's waiting there yes, just for yes, you hiding it's waiting i go for, like for four me bottles yeah. back. four bottles back <laughs> it's a better expiration day too i think oh. the bottle. Okay. a lot of times a lot of times there could be because uh, like in a dairy case when they load the milk they load it from the back. So they will put the newer stuff will actually be behind it. But if you're down the condiment aisle and you're buying a bottle of hot sauce, there's no different expiration date, but probably still will, I'll still reach past the first few to pull out one from the back. There's no reason for it, but people do it anyway you test it to make sure that it's repeatable so that the quality is the same. And actually that's a job that you can get with a bachelor's degree in nutrition and food studies. Like the one that you're trying to get now is a quality insurance, uh, quality assurance and quality control. So that was the sensory part of it. Now we have the hard data and this is what, this is how it would work. So you could use different kinds of equipment, um viscosity meter consistency meter uh mass spectrometer in the back of the lab which we don't have now i think there's a picture of it oh no never mind there's a picture in other slides basically you're using physical and chemical tests to make sure that the product is the same every single time so an objective analysis we'll just look at it this way so let's say that we're up and running we have our thousand bottles full filled and we're ready to sell but before we do that we're gonna compare the color to make sure it's right okay so let's look so comparing the standard color to the process batch so this is the first batch is it the same color it might be hard yeah. to see but yes it's the same color so that batch we know is good we can sell send that to the store right we have the next batch, same color. So we tested the color, it's the same. We could send that to the store as well. Is this the same color? No. no. So do we sell that? Do we send that to the store anyway? No, we yeah. throw that out because we can't sell that because our customers are expecting this color red. And if we want to stay in business, we give them the same thing all the time. Okay, so that's the difference between subjective is with the people. You usually, you could use like a sensory, the word sensory and subjective analysis can be used interchangeably. Okay, so that is finding out the preferences, finding out what people want. Objective analysis is taking 
those parameters that you already established that are known and making sure that your product looks, tastes, feels, smells the same way every single time. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. This is the thing in the back of the lab. So this is an example of objective analysis. This machine can test, uh, can establish chewiness. So instead of biting into a frozen bagel or a fresh bagel and saying which one is chewier or baking a chocolate chip cookie, you put it in the machine and an arm comes down and pushes into it and then retracts and it'll quantify chewiness. And it quantifies chewiness as hardness times cohesiveness times springiness. So it's what is happening in this little thing here that's being pushed onto the food. That's how you get chewiness. Crazy, right? Going back to color for a second, are any of you old enough to remember the days of purple ketchup? or green ketchup? I've heard so, of it. But you've heard of it, it. okay. So purple ketchup and green ketchup were what they sound like. They were, it was ketchup that was purple, and then there was a ketchup that was green. What do you think it tasted like? Regular ketchup. ketchup. Regular ketchup. Yeah. The only difference was the red coloring. It was still tomato ketchup. And why was it made? I would imagine to sell more ketchup to kids because how do you, how do you uh, increase ketchup sales, I guess, even though it's so popular already, they wanted to have now, instead of buying one red tomato ketchup, people had to buy the green one and the purple one to satisfy their kids because they wanted to try it. And if you tried it, you liked it. If you didn't, then it just sat in the refrigerator. So it just changed the color which is crazy to think about because if you can change the color of the ketchup and still have it taste like ketchup, then uh, where does the ketchup flavor come from? It's where does the similar. red color come from? The red color? Yeah, sometimes there's red color added. You would think it's from the tomatoes, but uh, have you ever heard of banana ketchup? Yeah. Yes. So what is banana ketchup? Yellow ketchup. No, it's red, but it's like, it's kind of more gelatinous -y. I don't know how to like describe it. Like I had it before. It's All right, so it's than little, regular ketchup. It's a little thicker, you think? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's not that it's thicker. It's like, it looks more like jello-y. Like, I don't know how to describe it. And it's sweeter. And it okay. got like things in it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, ketchup and bananas, like it's a Filipino thing, right? Yeah. So instead of tomatoes, it's bananas. But if you didn't know it, it might feel a little thicker or more gelatinous. But essentially, it has the same seasoning added to it, same spices added to it to taste like ketchup. So food coloring. I, there might be. Well, if it's red, there has to be something in. Right. There has to be something added to color banana like a banana paste red this is kind of similar to the whole thing when uh when kind of back when uh like halloween and like october didn't it, like burger king have like this black whopper kind of thing yes i think so yeah it was like this is kind of very similar to it because like people were saying that this tastes exactly like the whopper but like it's like a black like whopper like the the every everything on the burger was a different color everything like it was it was weird like there was some orange in it some black in it it was it was crazy halloween was it was a, it was a crazy month for Burger King. <laughs> i guess so i guess so this also happened uh you probably don't remember crystal pepsi it was clear like regular pepsi but it was clear and it didn't last very long because people hated it because yep. it looked like Seven Up or Sprite, but tasted like Pepsi, and they could not drink it, so it didn't do very well. Which was in the 
late 80s, early 90s. But now you have brands like, um, uh, what's it called? Zevia. Have you ever heard of them? The, the, like, it sounds like Stevia, but it's with a Z. They make uh, Stevia sweetened sodas, soft drinks. And they have cola and all the different soda, standard soda flavors. But they don't have color in any of them. Because the owner said that enough people complained that they didn't want caramel color added or anything. So they took all the colorants out. So no matter what flavor you get, it's clear. And people are happy about that. So in 2010, 2015, that's what people want. But in 1990, people wanted their caramel color because their cola had to look like cola. But now more people that are purchasing that type of product want to have as little as possible added to the food to still have the same feel, to have the same mouth feel, the same flavor, all, all those things. So those are just some examples. What I would like for you to do is start looking around at different products or if you have a favorite product or something that you want to know more about because what you're going to explore with these products are the ingredients that are used are they using are they saving money by using certain ingredients are they trying to give you the best thing possible ultimately you're going to look into the marketing who's the key demographic for the food product um how much money was spent on marketing, who manufactures the product, all those things you're going to find out. So just take a look around and uh, start thinking about what food you're going to have, you're, go you're going to pick. Again, any questions you have, send me a message. Don't hesitate to ask questions. We are not meeting live. Well, no, well, next week is Labor Day, so there's no classes anyway. So the next recorded meeting will be on the 14th, okay? So there's nothing due on the 14th. Just try to find a food, think of a food. Um, actually, there is one thing that's due on the 14th. I misspoke. I knew I forgot something, sorry about that. Uh, let's see, one second, one second. So, if you go into the module for today, there's a syllabus review. And it's basically 12 questions. Office hours are via Zoom by appointment, I understand. Live class meetings will be held via Zoom. There are no on-campus meetings for this course. I understand. So just 12 things I understand. And it's all from the syllabus. It's cut and paste from the syllabus. And this is due prior to the start time of class on the, on the 14th. So I think the due date is actually 8.29 a.m. And then at 8.30, it disappears and locks. So it has to be done before you start class on, uh, before, before, just do it by 8.29 on September 14th, okay? It probably is in your best interest just to do it now so you don't forget, okay? Um, again, that's in the modules tab. Right there, syllabus review. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? Okay. That's it for this week, and I'll see you soon. Have Take care, day. everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you.